on the air with that surprising decision out of a Florida court, right, with a judge suggesting they'll release some, but not all, of the justification for why the FBI took documents from former President Trump's Florida home. We're going to take you inside the courtroom with what the Justice Department has to do now. Plus, new steps today to slow down this monkeypox outbreak with the White House pumping out more vaccines and antivirals. What new research is telling us about how this thing spreads. And experts say we're in a so-called housing recession with sales slowing down. So wait a second. If there's not a ton of demand, why are houses still so expensive? We'll explain. Plus, that umbrella you forgot at home, you don't need it. Because for more than half the country, there is no rain in sight. The new numbers out today showing how these extreme drought conditions now could affect this country for years. And Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson getting an 11-game suspension because of the dozens of sexual assault allegations against him. How the NFL settled on this number after they wanted something a lot tougher coming up later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with this surprise move from a judge in Florida, not totally smacking down the request to unseal the affidavit that explains why the former president's Mar-a-Lago home was searched. We're talking about the document that led the FBI to take back 11 sets of classified material from this place, the ball, now in the Justice Department's court. We just got our hands on Judge Bruce Reinhardt's order, where he says, quote, I find that on the president record, the government has not met its burden of showing that the entire affidavit should remain sealed. OK, in human terms, what does that mean? It means, sorry, government, you're not going to get to keep this whole thing a secret. And so as we now know from that 90 minute hearing, the DOJ will get seven days. So they have a week from today to propose redactions, basically what they want sharpied out. When that's done, they'll give it to the judge, and he makes the call on whether or not that's acceptable. Again, to be clear, the DOJ didn't want any of this. They said releasing any part of the affidavit could jeopardize the early stages of its investigation. Lawyers from media organizations like us here at NBC News who want it released did not object to this kind of middle ground choice from the judge. The speculation, of course, has been swirling since Attorney General Merrick Garland had let this judge unseal the warrant and list of items the FBI took. Two law enforcement sources tell NBC News they're still sifting through that material, trying to figure out exactly what is relevant to their case. Mr. Trump, for his part, he wants this out there, he says now. A spokesperson for the former president says no redactions should be necessary and the whole affidavit should be released. And on that note, we're learning today there are talks inside Trump world about releasing surveillance video from the search. We'll get to that and the bigger picture with Ken Delanian in a second. But I want to start with our Sam Brock in West Palm Beach. And this is super interesting, Sam. I've talked with legal experts who say they're kind of blown away by this, right, including one former judge who said she was really surprised that this judge went ahead and found this kind of middle ground, right, cracking the door open for at least some of this affidavit to be unsealed. Tell us more about what it was like at the courthouse today. And the middle ground remains to be seen. Is that redacted version going right. to be mostly blocks of black on pages, or will there actually be substantive information that comes out of this? So that's a huge question that still needs to be determined, Allie. But I will say this. A couple observations from behind the scenes, because I know you love that. There was some media presence here. There was not a ton. It wasn't throngs of media. And I suspect the reason why is because the expectation coming into this is it would be a blanket rejection of requests to unseal that affidavit. Obviously, that's not what's going to happen. Christina Bob Halley, who was the attorney for Trump and for his team, she didn't say anything. That was also shocking. She was in the front row of this. We heard from multiple lawyers representing media corporations such as our own. We also heard from judicial watchdog groups. Nada, crickets from Trump's own attorney. That was a bit of a surprise as well. But here we are in a position where the judges basically said, look, I understand the concerns that DOJ, DOJ is voicing, but you got to prove it. The burden is on you to show why releasing this information would imperil someone's life or derail this investigation. There's a few different quotes that I think are pretty exemplary of what happened today. So let's show you those. The first one relates to the DOJ saying, we understand the heightened concern right now, the heightened risk that the public has a right to know. However, they say there is another public interest at stake. That interest is that the criminal investigation is actually able to go forward. Now, Charles Tobin, who was the lawyer for NBC Universal, represented a couple of other media outlets as well, Washington Post, Associated Press. He says, you cannot trust what you cannot see. In other words, you can say that this information is privileged, but that should be for us to decide. Once we go through the legal lens of what is or is not appropriate, I think really we should put this in the public forum and let them decide. James Moon from Judicial Watch. This is not business as usual, and it should not be treated as such. And this is a really important point. He's saying, look, we understand DOJ. You're saying you've already broken precedent by releasing the search warrant, by releasing the inventory of the documents that were taken. All right, 
That cat's out of the bag. You've already gone above and beyond. Why would you stop now in terms of viewing this as what precedent says we should do? You've already broken your own rules. There is no reason not to continue to explore that given the extraordinary nature of this investigation, Alec. You know, Sam, th you're right. We do love to see when you pull back the curtain and give us some of a sense of this behind the scenes. That you, you, we, when we do that, I think we also have to think about the broader climate here, and that is of security concerns, frankly. We saw that joint bulletin. We reported it here on this show about warnings to federal law enforcement agents at, at risk of more violence ever since this search happened. And that includes, by the way, the very judge who is going to decide on whether or not to unseal all or pieces of this affidavit. Judge Reinhardt, talk to us about that. I'm so glad you made that point because it really struck me as really significant in this case as well. The judge himself, the same judge who signed off on the search warrant, has been looking at death threats, an absolute wave of anti-Semitic remarks, largely from the far right on social media platforms. He has been under duress, and he's hearing arguments from the federal government that FBI agents are already receiving death threats. In fact, two of them, whose names were unredacted in the original search warrant, they have faced death threats. And this isn't like a hypothetical. Last week in Cincinnati, there was an attack on an FBI office. So he's looking at this in real time and even knowing what he's receiving, made this decision to try to toe the line for the public between what is necessary for the American people to see and to digest for themselves and what needs to be kept under wraps. But I will also say Palm Beach County Gardens or Palm Beach Gardens County, excuse me, uh, their police force did also issue a statement in which they said the Palm Beach Gardens Police Department is aware of the threats against Judge Reinhardt. We are working with our federal law enforcement partners Looking at that statement, it appears to be an ongoing threat. There is no question at all that this is part of the conversation. It's part of the DOJ's argument for why they want to keep this all sealed. They say it is core to that argument that there is a real threat that confidential sources and witnesses could be imperiled by releasing this information. The judge will ultimately decide. Sam Brock, glad you're there for us in West Palm Beach. It's good to see you as always. Thank you. I want to go to Ken Delanian. And Ken, let me pick up where Sam is leaving off there, right? So bottom line, in a week, DOJ is going to either submit a whole bunch of Sharpie dot pages or just some Sharpie dot pages, whatever they think the redaction should be. But on this climate, this sort of this, this threat climate, if you will, that exists around this case, it relates to another piece of developing news we're learning this afternoon, which is that there are some in Donald Trump's inner circle who want him to release surveillance video of this search. I know you have some reporting that the DOJ says, please, no, don't do that. Why? Well, they're very concerned that the agents involved in the search will be identified by their faces and would be subject to the same kind of threats that those other agents who are named in the warrant, which was disclosed by some news organizations, have been subject to, which is some very serious threats uh, in the wake of an attack on an FBI office. Um, and they're asking, the DOJ is asking news organizations that if the Trump folks do release the surveillance camera to please blur the faces of FBI agents. Um, that's what it's come to. And look, I think Sam beautifully laid out some of the risks involved here um, and the things that could be exposed in this affidavit. I am confident that there will, whatever happens here, there will be no names of witnesses, no names of FBI agents exposed. That, that is, that's a no-brainer. Those will definitely be redacted. And in fact, I, I think we should te temper our expectations about what we're going to see here because um, there's so many things, including grand jury material, which is secret by law, involved in this investigation that cannot be exposed, just can't right. be exposed. Um, the only real, real question here is, are we going to see more than the background of the FBI agent who filled out the, the, the affidavit, which you often see in these things? You know, or, or, and you may see sort of a, there's usually a preamble about how classified information works and why, you know, top TSSCI stuff shouldn't be exposed. But in terms of the specifics, the roadmap to the investigation, um, it'd be hard to believe that some of that would be exposed. But this judge must think that the public can learn something from the parts that he ultimately will reveal. Keeping in mind that this is an extraordinary case, this is not obviously, you know, your average Joe, if you will. This is the former president of the United States, uh, and I think you saw some nods to that in court today. Talk to us then as we look at this investigation, like these, these documents that are at the center of it, where are they? The FBI is still looking through them, right? I mean, that's a huge piece of this, too. They are. They're, I mean, 
it, it was hard to judge from the returns that we saw exactly how many documents we're talking about because they talked about sets of documents and boxes of documents. But this is what we know. Ten days after the search, the filter team is still going through this stuff. And that's the team of independent prosecutors and agents who are trying to pick out things that are covered by attorney-client privilege. They're trying to pick out things that are irrelevant, like Trump's passports, which they gave back to him. And they're also looking for classified material. And once they, uh, you know, remove all the stuff that's not relevant and not and shouldn't be seen, then they'll turn the material over to the actual investigating case agents who are going to go through it for their case. And uh, the fact that it's still going on speaks to the large volume of documents we're talking about and the care that, with which the FBI uh, is approaching you know, this this case. And the fact that they returned Trump's passports, that would not normally happen to a typical defendant. Even when they see stuff that probably isn't relevant to the investigation, a normal defendant or subject has to wait for a while. Uh, they're clearly treating this as a special case, Hallie. Let me take a turn with you here, Ken, to something that is still sort of Donald Trump related, but in a different orbit, because there is some significant news on the part of the longtime Donald Trump money man, a guy named Alan Weisselberg, who was the CFO of the Trump organization. He now, as of today, today, he pled guilty as part of a plea deal. He's getting five months in prison, and he's going to have to testify against the Trump organization in this broader look at the Trump organization's finances. But what's important here is the distinction. There is no indication that Weisselberg will try to implicate his former boss, Mr. Trump himself. That's right. He's going to do five months at Rikers Island. He's going to pay $2 million in back taxes and fines, and he's going to testify if he fulfills this agreement against the Trump organization but not against the former president. And for that reason, backers of the, of the former president see this as a victory for him because what they believe is that the this prosecution was solely designed to pressure Weisselberg to provide incriminating information about Trump, and that's not what's happening. At the same time, if they convict the Trump organization of crimes in court, that will, will presumably impact Donald Trump's real estate empire, Hallie. Ken Delanian, on top of it, as always, for us tonight. Thank you. A lot of news to get to, too, unrelated to Donald Trump, including the White House and the CDC stepping up the push to try and stop the monkeypox outbreak. They've got a new plan out today involving more vaccines. We're talking 1.8 million more shots. They're also trying to get people more access to an antiviral treatment called T-pox. The administration says it's on phase four of this national vaccine strategy. And now they're trying to raise awareness about this even more. They're sending teams to cities with big gay pride events coming up, like in Atlanta and Charlotte, hoping to spread the word about vaccines and safety. At the same time, there are some new questions about how exactly this disease is spreading, with new research suggesting sex between men, not skin contact, is what's fueling this monkeypox outbreak. Let's bring in Dr. John Torres here. And let's start broadly with this plan, Dr. John, because the CDC is confirming more than 13,000 cases in the U.S., 93 percent of them, so the vast majority, among men who have sex with men. Talk about, as you look at this new plan the government has laid out that we just described, is that going to help, right? Presumably it will. Is it too little too late? Yeah, Hallie, I think when you look at the plan on paper, it looks great. It looks like it's going to help. And it's at least a start in the right direction of trying to get this under control quicker than they've tried in the past. But like anything else, you know, plans on paper aren't necessarily the way plans pan out. And so let's see what happens over the next couple of weeks. But like you mentioned, number one, they're increasing the dosing. They've done that splitting one dose into five now using a different way of administering the vaccine that is effective. And so they're saying we have 1.8 million doses now. We're going to give it to jurisdictions that are using that new way. Way of administering it and have used over 90% of what they've already been given. On top of that, like you mentioned, they are targeting events that men who have sex with men end up going to, private and public events. And what they're doing is allocating 50,000 doses at those events and letting people know at the event, and this is important, the communication part of it, that, hey, we're giving you this vaccine right now. It's not going to protect you during this event. It's going to protect you down the road, and you need to follow up with the second vaccine. And so they're trying that communication part as well. But I think overall, what they're doing here is trying to both make sure that people get vaccinated, have the knowledge they need to protect themselves, and try to use all these to keep it under control. Now, one of the big problems with this, though, is they're not ignoring, but they're basically not putting as much emphasis in the areas where there aren't high numbers of this monkeypox right now. And it's like a fire. You know, they're they're hitting the big fires and they're letting the smoldering embers stay there. Hopefully those smoldering embers reignite themselves and cause other issues. But time will tell with that, Allie.
How should we understand these new studies, this new research that suggests it is sex between men and not skin contact that is fueling monkeypox? Because I think it is worth noting here that, like, this is not a sexually transmitted disease. So far as we had known, it seemed like anybody could get it. And, you know, this is a huge debate in the medical community and the public health community. Is this a sexually transmitted infection? And the reason being that up until now, monkeypox has been spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact. And initially, the thought was, okay, this is skin-to-skin -skin contact that they're having during these sexual encounters, but now it looks like it might be driven by sex itself. And like you mentioned, the vast majority of, of the cases are men who've been having sex with men. And so the thinking is, and the definition of sexually transmitted infection is an infection that is predominantly transmitted through sex. And so the thinking is, you know, is this part of that? The other issue, though, on the other side of the coin is we are seeing cases where children have gotten it. We have seen cases where adults have gotten it that have not had sexual encounters. And so that skin to skin contact is still causing the spread. What they need to figure out is what's causing this. And the reason this is important is because getting that message out and communicating it appropriately is one step in making sure that we get this under control. Dr. John Torres, good insight. Thank you so much, as always, for being on for us tonight. We've been talking on the show about how the economy has been giving us all sorts of mixed signals. And a new housing report out today is showing that the market for possible home buyers, well, that's also a little bit confusing. According to the National Association of Realtors, the housing market is slowing down. The sale of previously owned homes, in other words, homes that aren't like brand new built, those fell by about 6% in July, 20% in all since the same time a year ago. And those numbers are a total shocker, right? With the Fed raising interest rates to fight record high inflation, mortgage rates have been up, and usually inventory slows down in the summer. But economists and realtors are telling CNBC, we are in a housing recession. That's right, they are using the R word on this one. CNBC's uh, housing expert, Diana Olick, a reporter for the network, joins us now. So what is up with this dip in home sales? Is it low inventory? Is it the fact that housing prices are still really high? Help us understand this. Uh, yes, yes, and yes, it's all of the above. Look, you've got low supply, still strong demand, but very high home prices, sharply rising mortgage rates, not to mention inflation and concern among consumers in the greater economy that maybe now is not the time to make the biggest purchase of my life, right? So all these things put together are pulling home buyers back. Affordability is absolutely weaker than it was just six months ago. And for some buyers, especially first-time buyers, sky-high rents are keeping them from being able to save for a down payment. Also, some of them are just no longer qualifying for a mortgage at these higher rates. Hallie? We've got this. You talked about this drop in demand, right? Let me split it into two buckets here. People who already own a home and people who want to own a home. Okay? If you already own a home, should you be like, oh, man, this huge investment that I've made, should I be concerned about it? If you want to buy a home, are you like, hey, yeah, mortgage rates are high. Also, the housing prices are really high. Like, how should we understand this? So if you own a home and you've owned it for a while, don't worry about it. You've gotten so much equity in the last couple of years. Home prices are up over 40 percent since the start of the pandemic. So even if the price gains start to shrink a little bit, you're not losing anything because you have gained so much trillions of dollars collectively of home equity over the last several years. Now, if you bought in the last six months, well, maybe you have a little more to worry about. But again, the vast majority of Americans who own a home have nothing to worry about when it comes to the value. Also, mortgage underwriting has been much stricter since the Great Recession, so we don't have any of those low-doc, no-doc, right. some prime mortgages that crashed the economy before. So don't worry about that. If you're a home buyer, you know, it's a pricey market. It's still slightly competitive, but not nearly as it was before. It's just, you know, you have to look at your at your affordability level, at your comfort level in putting this kind of money down, knowing that the market is significantly softer than it was. Dana Olick from CNBC. Love having you on. I feel like I get it now. And that's kind of the sure. point. So thank you. Appreciate <laughs> Yay. it. Yay. New numbers out today show that more of the Northeast, right, where we are, Washington, New York, et cetera, now under extreme drought conditions. How about that? So now one county in New York is taking some pretty extreme measures, like saying restaurants cannot serve water unless customers specifically ask for it. They're saying you can only water your lawn on certain days. It comes as the government agency that monitors climate shows that it is super dry for a whole lot more people across the country. Drought affecting 174 million people, more than half of us, 56 percent of this country's population. Gabe Gutierrez joins me now from Rockland County, New York, where there's a state of emergency. And I'm so struck by this, Gabe. You know, I used to live out in California and out in California. Right. We would have certain days you could water your lawn. You had to ask for water if you wanted it at restaurants. Now it's hitting the East Coast. It's really interesting. 
Uh, yeah, that's right, Hallie. We don't often see this happen in the Northeast. And of course, as you've been reporting on, we have been seeing these dramatic, dramatic images out of the Southwest, California, also Texas, Arizona, the Colorado River and all that. But this is what we're starting to see in the Northeast. Now, this is uh, Rockland County, and this is just, you know, one river here. And as you can see, it's there's still water. Of course, there is still water here, but it's kind of slowed to a trickle. And the locals here say that the water level, though, is much much lower than it normally is. All this in white, this is typically where water would be well above this. I would be standing in water, but that's changed over the last couple of weeks. And you mentioned that Rockland County is now in a stage two water emergency and they starting today, they've imposed these water restrictions, essentially uh, making it so that if you go to a restaurant, you don't automatically get water. You have to ask for it. People can only, you know, water their lawns on specific days. And earlier this afternoon, just a short time ago, we spoke with a business owner here in Rockland County who owns a landscaping company. And he says that his business has already dropped by nearly half over the past few weeks. Take a listen. How much drier has it been over the past couple of weeks than the past couple of years? Severe. We haven't had any decent rain. Nothing is really growing. It's really affecting my business. So, yeah, Hallie, that uh, man that we spoke with, he says that, you know, normally in a week, his landscaping company has around 500 customers. Now that's down to less than 300, and he expects it to get even worse with these new water restric restrictions taking effect, Hallie. I think what's important to think about when we look at the broader context of this game is that there is a domino effect here because it's like, I don't know, I think sometimes maybe people think, oh, it's a drought, okay, it's not going to rain, my lawn's going to look not ideal. Right. It's way more than that because if there's not rain, right, if there's not water, it affects agriculture. You got dairy farms in Vermont. They're already having problems, right, getting enough to feed their livestock. It feels like there is going to be a trickle-down effect where this hits our pocketbooks. Yeah, absolutely, Allie. And look, I've, you know, been covering droughts across this, uh, you know, country for, you know, at least uh, the at least the past decade. And while we do hear about it in different parts of the country, I remember in, in Georgia several years ago, there was a very significant drought. So it does move to different pockets. But here in the Northeast, doesn't quite happen quite as often. This is the worst drought, according to local officials in this area, in at least six years. And it's expected to get even worse. There is some rain forecast in this area in the next week, but not nearly enough to make a dent in this drought. And as you mentioned, yes, in Vermont, dairy farmers struggling to feed their livestock that of course trickles down into other parts of the U.S. economy. We spoke with one expert from Yale that says that this is, you know, climate changes will have a dramatic effect on the U.S. economy, economy moving forward. And we're even starting to see it a worldwide problem, Hallie. And uh, in, in China, for example, this heat wave that's uh, hitting that country with uh, temperatures more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit is shutting down semiconductor factories there that make microchips that are exported here to the U.S. And so worldwide economy under threat by this unprecedented unprecedented drought in many parts of, uh, of the world, really, Howie. Gabe Gutierrez, uh, I'm glad to see you. Thank you. We'll look for more of your reporting tonight on Nightly News, as always, Gabe. Thanks. To Ukraine now, with more and more concern about Europe's biggest nuclear power plant. NBC News spoke with Ukrainian military intelligence, who say Russia told its workers not to show up to work tomorrow. Don't go to the plant. You think, why? Why would you be told not to go, right? Well, there's speculation that Russia is planning something, potentially some kind of a false flag operation. Officials are holding disaster drills in hazmat suits. In this war overall, 12 people have now been killed after Russian missiles hit the Kharkiv area just recently. All of it as Ukrainian's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, hosted the leaders of Turkey and the United Nations to talk about getting more grain exported. That's been a big deal. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now from Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, Megan, talk about this, first of all, this warning here, this idea that, that these workers at a nuclear plant are saying, hey, don't, we shouldn't come to work tomorrow here. I explain the significance of that, because it is significant. Yeah, Hal, you're absolutely right. Incredibly significant. You know, we're talking about a really serious situation that certainly appears to just be escalating. Uh, just within the last couple of hours, the U.S. State Department saying they are deeply concerned that Russia is occupying this nuclear power plant. Uh, just within the last couple of hours as well, we heard from the secretary, the U.N. Secretary General, uh, who is saying that this is of grave concern and he is calling on Russia to pull out. Take a listen to what they had, what he had to say earlier today. 
Common sense must prevail to avoid any actions that might endanger the physical integrity, safety or security of the nuclear plant. And the facility must not be used as part of any military operation. Yeah, now, earlier today, Russian military officials accused Ukraine of planning a provocation. Uh, then, of course, you know, we're hearing from Ukraine who says, look, this is just an example of Russia uh, laying the groundwork here so that they can create an incident inside that plant and then blame Ukraine for it. Also, keep in mind that Russia has threatened to shut that plant down, uh, something that Ukrainian officials say could be catastrophic. Because remember, the biggest concern here right now is for a leak, a leak of radioactive uh, material being picked up by winds that could sweep across Europe, putting in danger millions of people, Hallie. The two headlines out of Ukraine today, and Megan, you've explained it so well, but it's nukes and it's grain, right? So we've talked about the nuclear part of it. Let's talk about the grain part of it, because the, the yeah. U.N. chief said today there is no solution to the global food crisis without making sure that people have access to the food that Ukraine produces, Russia, fertilizers, et cetera. How, what's, where do we stand now in these discussions? Yeah, Holly, I'm so glad to be talking about this. This is an absolutely critical situation in that deal that was brokered uh, by Turkey President, uh, Turkish President uh, Erdogan, along with U.N. Secretary General uh, Guterres uh, between Russia and Ukraine is just uh, paramount in this entire situation. It's a four month deal that started on August 1st that allows these ships to leave the ports with that critical grain heading towards these nations that are desperate for it uh, to places in Africa. Africa, along with Asia and the Middle East, uh, they can leave without the fear of being targeted, without the fear of being shot at. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about a global food crisis here. We know that 82 nations are food insecure. Uh, 45 of them are on the brink of famine. Uh, the U.N. Secretary General saying earlier today that this is a successful mission so far. Since August 1st, they've seen 21 ships leave the port, heading to these critical destinations to try and get that food out. And so far, he says, uh, that it's already having a positive impact, Hallie. Megan Fitzgerald, live for us there in Kiev with that important reporting. Megan, thank you so much. Today, Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson reached a settlement with the NFL and the Players Union for an 11-game suspension and a $5 million fine. He'll also have to be evaluated by behavioral experts after some two dozen women made sexual misconduct allegations against him. Today... Watson, who's been embroiled in this controversy, says he's grateful the process has ended, but he says he's innocent. I'm moving, I'm moving on with my career and my life, and I'm continuing to stand on my innocence. Just because, you know, settlements and things like that happen doesn't mean that a person is, is guilty for anything. This whole saga really has been just hugely controversial. Watson had initially gotten a six-game suspension earlier this month. The NFL got some backlash for that. Some of people said those repercussions were nowhere near what they should have been, given the extent of the accusations made against Watson. He settled 23 out of 24 lawsuits filed by women who said he harassed or assaulted them in massage appointments. George Solis is joining us now. And there had been a lot of anticipation, George, on where this suspension would ultimately land. It's tougher than it was initially. It's not as tough as what the NFL had wanted. What more do we know about the decision making here? Yeah, Hallie, good to be with you. You know, this was a back and forth. And as you mentioned, a federal judge who presided over that initial hearing called for that six game suspension. And yes, the NFL said, hey, that's not good enough. We're looking at suspending him for the entire football season. So what did they do? Well, the NFL brings in former New, Ter New Jersey Attorney General Peter C. Harvey to appeal that decision. And of course, some Decisions are being held through some closed door meetings. There's a back and forth. Of course, through all this, Watson is still denying, then sort of alluding to the fact that some of these allegations may be true. Eventually, we get to the decision that we saw today. You know, this really felt like, and, and while this 11 game suspension is now one of the stricter punishments in the league's history, this felt in many ways like a test for the league and how they have chosen to handle sexual misconduct allegations. When you talk with experts, when you talk with observers of this extremely popular league, you know, what do they say about where the NFL is right now on this? That's right, Hallie. And this sort of kind of goes in line with what Roger Goodell has always sort of 
painted a picture of for the league. He's handed out some of the strictest punishments we have seen to date. One of the first ones that comes to mind was Michael Vick during the dog fighting scandal. He missed out on two seasons of playing football. But Goodell has also put in some provisions where he will punish players even if they aren't necessarily convicted of crime. Another one that comes to mind, Deflategate with Tom Brady. Uh, Brady missing out on four games. So again, this is still kind of going in line with his policies, even though at this point, sometimes we do see, as we saw in this case, a third party will come in to do some of the arbitration, but it's still the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, that gets the final say. George Solis, thank you very much for that update. Appreciate it. FBI documents obtained by NBC News are giving us a look into what exactly happened between two international superstars, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, during a heated and apparently sometimes physical fight they had on their private jet back in 2016. That's when Pitt, according to the documents, allegedly grabbed Jolie by the head, shaking her, and punched the ceiling of the plane something like four times. The documents say that when Jolie and the kids tried to get off the plane, Pitt would not let them, yelling, you are not getting off this effing plane, F you all. The FBI started looking into what happened, and five weeks later after this all went down, they decided to close their investigation, filing no charges against anybody, not against Pitt. And you'll remember what happened not too long after that. Jolie filed for divorce in September of 2016 in a very public split. Even though Jolie was declared legally single in 2018, the two still are going through some custody stuff. The FBI representatives for Jolie and Pitt have all declined to comment. Ryan Riley joins us now. So, Ryan, I think the first question that comes to mind for a lot of people is, we are learning this now from FBI documents that have now been obtained by NBC. Why is the FBI even involved in this Pitt-Jolie thing to begin with? You know, it's the location uh, of the incident here that really comes into play, Haley. It's essentially because it happened on a plane. The FBI handles a number of these investigations into uh, incidents that happen on planes, air rage, you might call it. That's a common charge that we sort of uh, see, or investigation that we sort of see coming out of this. So it's really just about the location of where this took place because of jurisdictional issues. When you're up in the air, it's a little bit of a complicated matter when you're flying over the sky about what jurisdiction you're actually committing an alleged crime in. So that's essentially why the FBI has gotten involved here. So tell us more about what we've learned from this report, these documents now. Sure. So, you know, FBI documents aren't typically the way that you would go to your local police department and you get a report, right? Like a lot of this, the reason that this has been such a struggle is because um, then the reason that there's this FOIA lawsuit, this Freedom of Information Act uh, lawsuit attached to this is because it's, it's difficult to get these uh, underlying uh, FBI documents if you're not directly involved. A lot of news organizations, you know, including NBC News, uh, frequently file uh, requests after someone has died. That's really the only way you can get information uh, uh, from an FBI file um, afterwards. You also, you are allowed to request information about you individually if you sign a particular form. So because uh, Angelina Jolie was involved in this incident, she had a right to um, obtain some of those documents. But, you know, given the history of the FBI, they very much like to not send out those uh, documents and about ongoing investigations or even previous investigations um, unless there's some sort of privacy waiver uh, that is filed in these cases. So, you know, Angelina Jolie in this case would have a right to view a more limited uh, number of documents because she was a direct, uh, she was directly involved uh, in this incident, Haley. There are a lot of questions here. We know that the FBI shared this reporter, or at least that is what that those around this incident have said, that both parties, Jolie and Pitt, both got this in 2017. But there's been this recently, um, this, this, as you talk about, this FOIA lawsuit um, looking to get the documents released. There's some, talk to us about the speculation behind that, who's behind this, what, what the sort of broader picture is here. Right. So it was filed uh, anonymously as a Jane Doe lawsuit initially, and then there had been some more disclosure about who exactly, and sort of reporters put the dots together and figuring out uh, who exactly this was. But, you know, there are a lot of documents that are involved in FBI investigations beyond perhaps what they initially got. So I think they want to get into the details about exactly why this decision not to bring charges forward uh, was decided upon, apparently, uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, which would have made the ultimate prosecutorial decision about whether or not uh, to bring bring these charges, bring any charges forward based upon the FBI's report that they wrote up of this incident. So I think they want some more of those uh, broader documents that might shed some more light uh, on this incident in this, as this sort of custody battle uh, continues, Haley. Ryan Riley, thank you very much. Good to see you.
We've got to get to some of that breaking news now out of West Virginia, because we've just learned in about the last 20 minutes that three men have been indicted for beating mob boss Whitey Bulger to death back in October of 2018 at a federal prison in West Virginia. Bulger was 89 years old and spent 10 years on the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. At the time, he'd been serving, I think it was two consecutive life sentences when he died. He was found guilty in 2013 on 31 counts related to his time running Boston's notorious Winter Hill Gang. I want to go to our legal analyst, Danny Savalos. Danny, tell us what we know about this indictment, what we're learning, your takeaways. So far, three men indicted, uh, one of them, Freddie Gass, who was, as I understand, a suspect for some time. I mean, this beating death happened in 2018. Keep in mind, it happened in 2018 at USP Hazleton in West Virginia. The USP uh, for, in the prison hierarchy is reserved for uh, higher security, uh, much more dangerous offenders than your FCI Federal Correctional Institute. So uh, Whitey Bulger was at a prison full of other dangerous folks. And so uh, he was beaten to death, found in a wheelchair, apparently almost unrecognizable. Uh, it's taken several years to determine who to charge, uh, which is surprising. But uh, finally, an indictment coming down. Most likely, I don't believe Gaius was actually incarcerated at the time. I could be wrong about that. So he may have been possibly someone outside that was involved orchestrating it. But uh, DOJ doesn't have the indictment on their press release website yet, have not seen the indictment yet. So maybe that has some more information once that uh, makes its round. Danny Savalos, thank you for the uh, debrief. As always, good to see you, especially when it's breaking news. Thanks. Coming up, the Biden administration stepping in to try to keep our supply chain on track. Why? Because we run the risk of a rail strike in just a couple of weeks. We'll talk to you about it coming up. Plus, a new video showing a woman in the back of a police car escaping her cuffs and shooting at officers. Look at this. We're going to show you more coming up next in The Local. Thanks. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all... Our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, the CDC is warning of an E. coli outbreak after at least 29 cases have been reported in Ohio and Michigan. It sent nine people to the hospital so far. We don't know what the source of the outbreak is yet, but officials are talking with people about what they ate before they got symptoms. We'll keep you updated on that. From our Southeast Bureau, new video out of Oklahoma shows the moments that a woman detained in a police car slipped out of her handcuffs. Are you looking at this? She grabs a gun. She starts firing out the window. She hits somebody standing nearby and a deputy, and then police say she barricaded herself inside the car for five hours. The sheriff's office says the handcuffs were secure, they say, but they're looking into changing security measures inside patrol cars. The woman is facing three counts now of shooting with intent to kill. From our West Coast Bureau, you are looking at one of the world's biggest moths, an atlas moth that doesn't live in the U.S. so far as we know, but it was spotted for the very first time in Washington state. Now, it can be 10 inches of a wingspan. It's typically found in Asian forests. Officials are asking people to keep an eye out for them. They don't know if this is a random escapee, right, or if there's a whole bunch of atlas moths out there that we just don't know about. So West Coast fans, keep your peepers peeled. The clock is ticking now to prevent a big crisis that could totally upend our supply chain in this country at a time when it's already struggling. Because if railroads and 115,000 workers don't come to some kind of a labor deal in the next 30 days, basically all the freight trains in this country could grind to a halt. So in steps President Biden with an offer put together by a special advisory board. All right, this is a big enough deal that the White House is stepping in. This proposal suggests a 24 percent pay raise over five years right in the middle of what both sides want. The deal includes $5,000 in bonuses, but it makes employees take on a bigger share of health care costs with no changes to the sick day policy at the railroads. That policy, by the way, is zero days. Neither side so far has tipped their hands on whether they like the deal. But listen, the anger is real right now. Workers who haven't gotten a raise in three years tell NBC News the industry's 24-7 on-call lifestyle, they say, is turning one of the country's best blue-collar jobs into one marred by misery and neglect. Carol Lee is traveling with the president in Wilmington, Delaware. And Carol, we were really intrigued by this story because it's under the radar right now, but could really bubble up to the surface mm -hmm. sometime soon. We haven't seen a rail strike in decades, since 1991. That one ended pretty quickly. But walk us through how we got to this point and why it got so intense that President Biden and the White House team needed to step in. 
Well, if you step back, this, these are negotiations that have been going on for several years. And look, the, from the workers' perspective, they've been being asked to do a lot more with a lot less. And so there's a lot of frustration there. The number of employees that working for railroad companies has really decreased in re recent years and continues to drop. Railroad companies have been making cuts and, and again, asking people to who work for them now to do more. There are longer trains. There are fewer people who are being able to work on them and so it's very become a very arduous sort of job that it didn't hadn't always been now from the company's perspective they're saying they, they recognize that they need to do more they feel like a deal would actually allow them to hire more workers and that they need to step up in terms of making sure that things are running on time so there's recognition on both sides that that they need to come to some sort of resolution but they've been at a stalemate for some time, and so that's why you saw the White House step in for those reasons you said, Hallie, that it, this could really affect supply chains. People aren't thinking about this now, but they will be in 30 days if there's no deal because prices will go up, goods will be delayed, and there'll be a number of all these supply chain issues that we've been seeing will be exacerbated. So the White House appointed this board to make a recommendation to basically say, hey, guys, here's what we think you can do, and here's how you meet in the middle. The, they have that now, and they just need to work it out over the next 30 days. But as you said, the clock is ticking. Yeah, you make a really important point, Carol, because if there's two things that President Biden has made clear in his nearly five decades of public service, he likes trains and he likes unions. OK, so this is this is in his wheelhouse. But the timing on this mm -hmm. um, 30 days from now puts us just a couple of months out from the midterms. You know, it feels like reputationally there's a lot riding on the president to get to get a deal done, even if this is not yeah. at the top of the front burner in the eyes of the public at the moment. That's right. And so there's a couple ways this will affect the president, and they intersect. So that economically, this is something there's already concerns about the economy. People are hurting. There is inflation. There's supply chain issues. All of that would get potentially worse if there was a strike. So the president doesn't want that, because then that feeds into the second thing, which is the political ramifications of this, which is that if the president, this happens on the, president watch, the president's watch, again, hasn't happened since 1991. So it would be another thing that we haven't seen in decades decades that's happening while President Biden is in office, politically speaking, that would be disastrous for him. And you make a good point. This trains, unions, this train station behind me is named after President right. Biden here in Wilmington. He, he is a big fan of trains, right? And so that and unions who have backed him, he's been a long backer, time backer of unions. And so he's caught in the middle here a little bit. And I got a statement from the White House on this just about an hour ago where they said, look, the president is optimistic that they can reach a deal but underscored that this is something that is in the national interest, that the country needs these parties to reach some sort of resolution here within the next 30 days, in their view, as soon as possible, in yeah. order to avert some sort of disaster here. Carol Lee, live for us there, traveling with the president in Wilmington, home of the, what is it, the, the Joseph Robinette Biden train station, right? That's Joseph what it's called? R. Biden train, the Joseph R. Biden train station. Yeah, they say it several times when you arrive here. <laughs> Carol Lee with uh, racking up those Amtrak points. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate it. Coming up, Tiger Woods reportedly rallying top golfers, at least the ones who haven't already joined the Live Golf League, the PGA competitor. So what's next for the PGA and its big fight with this Saudi backed series? We've got the latest in the world of golf drama after the break. The PGA Tour continues today with the BMW Championship out in Wilmington, Delaware, teeing off. And the reason why we're talking about it, like we don't, we're not the golf channel, right? We're NBC News now. We don't cover this kind of thing, but there is real drama that is newsy happening. And it's because this tournament is going down as the PGA Tour is scrambling to show some unity among its top players. Thanks to this controversial Saudi-backed Live Golf Tour that's popped on the scene. Live has been poaching star players like Phil Mickelson and Dustin Johnson with big money. So this week, top golfers met ahead of today's tournament to talk about what the PGA Tour future looks like. And somebody showed up for that conversation. Tiger Woods, right? There today, another notable name reported at that meeting called Woods a hero. Says Woods showing up, according to Rory McIlroy, shows how much the 15-time major champ cares about the tour. He came in for the meeting, not the tournament, right? We, Woods is said to have recently turned down a seven to $800 million offer to join Live Golf. Did you hear that? Liv's CEO, Greg Norman, 
seven to eight hundred million. That's nearly a billion dollars to leave the PGA Tour, come over to live. Tiger said no. Rex Hoggard, a reporter for the Golf Channel, joins us now. You know, I just am so struck by the fact that Tiger Woods came out for this meeting. He's not even playing in the BMW Championship now, right? He is clearly trying to send a message. How important is his involvement in this whole thing? Oh, I think it was clear. Him being in that meeting, I don't even think we have that meeting if he's not there. He set the agenda. Roy McIlroy said it best. He said he was the alpha, and everyone wanted to flock to hear what Tiger Woods has had to say about this. And he's been very, very clear on this. He is leaning towards legacy. He's leaning towards the PGA Tour. And this was an opportunity, I think, given everything that's going on. You mentioned all of the top players who have gone to live golf over the last few weeks. It was a chance for Tiger to finally sit down and try to draw some sort of agenda, some sort of answer. So what is the agenda? What is the answer? What do they come up with? Not a lot of details outside of this meeting. It was no agenda, either public or otherwise. But my understanding is what they talked about is some sort of star-driven tour, that they need to answer whatever Live Golf is doing. And that starts and stops with the game's best players. Again, there was only mm. 22 players in this meeting. And it's important to point out that even the PGA Tour commissioner, Jay Monahan, was not in this meeting. So what I think they're looking at here is some sort of condensed schedule where you have the top players get together more often and they play for bigger purses. That's the answer that they're going to have to come up with long term to answer Live Golf. Because Live is basically chucking money at these big stars, right? I mean, the, the list of names, like, I, I think Bryson just went, right? I mean, some of these really big names just in the last few weeks have gone over to Live. How much trouble is the PGA Tour in? Because their point, you know, Live is basically saying, hey, PGA, you can't have a monopoly on golf. And the PGA is saying, yeah, well, you can't come in and do this with our players. The players want the guaranteed money, some of them. They do. And you mentioned all the top names. It was Phil Mickelson and Dustin Johnson, Bryson DeChambeau, Ian Poulter. Some of the game's biggest players have gone to take these huge appearance fees or take these huge guaranteed contracts. And the PGA Tour has been very, very clear about this. The commissioner, Jay Monahan, said it earlier this year that if this is a battle that's just being fought with dollar bills, it's not a battle the PGA Tour can win. The, the Saudi-backed funding of this t tour, yeah. Live Golf, it it's too much for the, for the PGA Tour to be able to compete in this situation. So, and this particular case, what the PGA Tour has tried to answer with, and they've already started to rework their schedule going into next year, and it's, again, a focus on bigger events where you get the main stars together, bigger purses, and I think that's what this meeting was about. I think they want to see more of this as far as an answer. Rex Hogger, thank you so much for that breakdown. I appreciate it, as always. That's a wrap for this hour. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow, same time, same place. Glad to have you with us, as always. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.